tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome back, friend. So here we are, together again on a very special night. Of course, in observance of National Asparagus Day, we're gonna have to keep it on the short side. What do you mean, cop out, Chester? I always knock off early on Asparagus Day. Where you been? Always blowing up my spot. Come on in, friend. Mmm. All right. Hey, speaking of asparagus, you ever been to simplyscarypodcast.com? You can sign up as a patron there and get their entire catalog dating back to 2012, ad-free and available to download or stream. For five lousy bucks a month, you get the whole kit and caboodle. And hey, if you find any change in the old couch cushions, check out patreon.com forward slash Drew Blood. Just saying. So tonight, we're joined by our old pal, Rory Dwayne, um, whom you might remember from his stories The Bells of Manteca and The Quaker. He's also the author of several books you can find on Amazon under R.C.J. Dwayne. This one's a tale of post-apocalyptia, inspired by The Road. So without further delay, from author Rory Dwayne, I give you Dire Straits. The end of the world happened slowly, like cancer spreading and eating your body whole. This is my story. Some said I was a fool preparing for the end. I guess it was a trait passed down to me, along with anger issues and a penchant for whiskey. I lost many good friends over the years through my own paranoia or the simple fact that I'm an asshole. I'm not sure. My wife, Renee, doesn't understand why I have a bunker in the middle of nowhere. Doesn't understand why I scour the conspiracy websites endlessly. It had begun slowly at first Vicious murders happening in distant lands, but soon became a problem domestically, and the army was called in. They coped at first, putting down the few stragglers that lurked in the city, but soon they fell beneath the waves as it broke like the tide of the ocean, and all drowned before it. Three months we stayed in that bunker, until that one day when the worst happened. The lantern is just dying when we hear the dog barking. I unfold my pistol from its oil cloth, cocking back the hammer as the grate of the bunker is open. Anyone down there? A voice calls. Silence. I'm unarmed, the gruff voice calls out once more, and the shadow appears on the ladder. Steve, my son's eyes are wide with fright. Renee is holding the shotgun, both of us training them on the figure that descends the ladder. The dog is still barking. Whoa there, he says seeing both of us armed. What do you want? I ask him. Just Bones found the bunker, says the man, 
pointing up at the bunker's entrance. I didn't think anyone was out this way. This is my land. What right do you have to come down here? I asked the man. Easy, friend. I just happened to cross the bunker. Thought I might have found some preppers' hidden cash. The man's eyes surveyed the room, taking in the depleted stores of food. I guess I was right, sort of. We've nothing to spare, I tell him. The man sighs. Look, I won't lie. I need food. I've only enough to last me a couple of days. Tough shit, I tell the man. And now I've got to consider the fact that you know where we live. My name is Frank, okay? Now you know me. I am not your enemy. That remains to be seen, I tell Frank. The man remains silent for a minute, thinking. You've been down here since the beginning? He asks. I nod. Yeah? What's it to you? I guess you're lucky. Shit. The cities are rampant with zombies. I guess that's why we're here, and not in the city. Frank points to a chair. Mind if I sit down? My knees aren't what they used to be. I nod. Frank sits. He takes a canteen and drinks from it. Do you mind pointing your weapon somewhere else? I sigh, slipping my pistol back under the oil skin. I nod to Renee. I'm Steve. This is my wife Renee and my boy, Steve Jr. I guess we know each other now, huh? Frank seems to ease somewhat and takes out a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> Doctor says these will kill me. <laughs> but since the world's going to hell, who cares? I laugh. <laughs> you got that right. Look, I'm sorry to ask. I don't want to beg, but things aren't great out there. People have changed. Frank shakes his head. I mean shit. It only takes the end of the world to reveal people's true nature. I guess that's why I chose to prepare, I say. It was only a matter of time. Frank nods. You got that right. I go to the food store and take two tins of beans, two tins of rice, then hand them to Frank. It's all we can spare. Frank looks into my eyes. Thank you. But I gotta say something. You won't last long down here. The raiders come by this place regularly. You've been lucky enough so far, but it's only a matter of time before. His eyes drift to Renee and Steve. Before what? I growl and I can't fight the threat in my voice. Come with me. Frank points to the roof. It's dangerous out there, but I can get by. I know these lands. Come with me, and I can get you to the coast. I laugh. The coast? <laughs> we live in the middle of nowhere. The coast is weeks away. Frank looks at the stores of food, and he counts it up. And I know right well what he's thinking. You won't last long on what you've got. There's food to be found on the way. Frank takes a drag of a cigarette. How do we know we can trust you? I ask. Frank pulls up his sleeve, revealing the Marine Corps tattoo. You have the look of a soldier about you. I nod. Served two tours with the Corps. Well, brother, from one soldier to another. 
I give you my word that I am the best chance you've got of surviving the winter. It's not far away, but I reckon if we put our resources and minds together, we just might make it. I look at Renee. Her eyes are wide, and I know I must make this decision alone. She depends on me for strength. Steve depends on me for guidance. I offer Frank my hand. He takes it in his, and our path was decided. It's cold. Cold enough for frost to kiss the grass blades come dawn. But we trudge along the highway, passing deserted cars. Hundreds of them. Harbingers of doom. Speaking of the panic and hopelessness that pass through people's hearts and minds at the end. People weren't prepared. We should check the store. Frank sniffs, looking at the shop. Its windows dark and empty. You both wait here. If there's trouble, whistle. I look into Renee's eyes, and she nods. I check my pistol, and then follow Frank towards the store. The door is locked, so we have to smash the window to gain entrance. Inside, the shelves are empty. Of course they are. Frank looks around. I check the back. I find a box of shells for a shotgun, pocket them, not much else, but better than nothing. I've got a box of bullets for the pistol, and the extra shotgun shells make two boxes. Not much, but I hadn't thought I'd need more than that to defend the bunker. We head back out the front, and that's when we hear the engine. Renee and Steve are hiding behind the car, and Frank and I duck down just as the jeep comes tearing around the corner. It glides past, and then jams down on the brakes, screeching to a halt. A man jumps out. Skinned head, muscled, tattoos. Bad news simply said. Frank's eyes are wide, I look back at the skinhead, who's walking to the shop now, and inspecting the broken window. Someone was here, says the skinhead. He looks around, spotting the pistol trained at him. Don't fucking move, I growl. I step out from behind the car. Tell your friend to get the fuck out of the jeep. Whoa! The skinhead holds up his hands. He has a long knife on his belt that looks like it's seen business. You know who we are? He asks. Dead men if your pal ain't out of the jeep in the next two seconds. I cock back the hammer of the pistol. The man nods. Terry, get out of the jeep. A short, balding man steps out of the jeep and walks around it. He's toting a pistol of his own. Tell Terry to drop the gun or you get another hole to breathe from. I nod to Terry. I ain't dropping shit but you, fool. Terry doesn't look like he could hit a damn fish in a can. Never mind a man standing more than 20 paces away. I see movement, but don't give anything away as Frank comes behind Terry. Silent as the grave, swift as death, and brings his elbow down onto the back of Terry's skull. He goes down like a bag of shit. Guess Terry's out for the count. I smile. You guys are dead. The skinhead smiles back. He takes a step closer and I let off a shot, taking him in the chest. His face drops and he falls to his knees. Blood leaks down his dirty vest top. 
He lets out a stifled curse as blood gurgles from his mouth, and he collapses. I approach Terry, who's still unconscious, and put a bullet in his brain. Frank looks at me and nods. No witnesses. I nod back. Dead men tell no tales, as they say. We make good progress in the Jeep. The highway is littered with cars, but these raiders have made tunnels and avenues through the chaos. Frank's driving. I'm riding shotgun with Steve on Renee's knee. Frank's dog, Bones, is in the back of the Jeep. We need to stop for gas soon. Frank nods to the needle, now approaching Red. Soon we stop at a station. Frank fills it up while I go and search inside. It's pretty much empty, besides two packs of smokes, which Frank will be pretty happy about, and a pack of gum for Steve. Back on the road, the miles slowly clock up. I swap places with Frank. He takes a nap as dust settles in the sky. And the way east is as red as the ground beneath poor Terry. I didn't feel one bit of remorse for killing them. My time in the Corps taught me to partition that part of myself, and I would never feel guilty about protecting those I love. You okay, honey? Renee asks me. I nod. You look tired. How about I drive? I shake my head. She was still learning the ropes and would probably drive us into a ditch. But it was okay. When you go on tour in Afghanistan, you learn the effects of sleep deprivation quick. I'm good, babe. I tell Renee. Get some sleep. She smiles and shuffles closer to Steve, who's snoring gently. I'm only doing 30 miles an hour, which might seem slow, but the highway isn't what it once was. Soon we cross state lines, inching our way closer to the coast. What awaits us there, I have no idea. What if we do find a boat? Where will we go? Neither myself or Frank are exactly navigators. We served in the Corps, not the Navy. But one problem at a time, as my father used to say. One problem at a time. We get a flat the next day, and the two dead shitheads hadn't thought to load a spare in the back of the Jeep. So, we're walking once again. Steve complains about his sore feet after the first three days, but at my scolding look, he falls silent. I'm not raising a son who complains. I'm raising him to be a man who takes his lashings with a smile. But he has his mother's heart. Whether that's a good thing or a burden, I'm still not sure. For days, we hike along that highway passing through towns, avoiding the zombies. During the day, they seem to be lethargic. They make up for it at night, though. Their screams audible from the forest where we sleep. It's on the fifth night of trekking along the highway that I hear rustling in the trees. Frank is awake. We've become accustomed to sit and watch together. He with Renee's shotgun. I guess I trust the old asshole after all. The figure comes stumbling out of the tree line. I could smell it before I saw it. Rancid, fetid flesh. We've been camping dark with only my torch, which I had cut out at the sound of the footsteps. Frank aims the shotgun at it. My eyes are still adjusting to the darkness. He seems to hesitate as I slip the knife from my belt 
and creep towards the zombie. Luckily, its back is turned to me. I take one step at a time, praying to a god I didn't believe in not to crack a goddamn branch or something. Thankfully, I don't. But I'm two steps away when Steve lets out a fart that you could hear from Alabama. God damn it! I snarl, and the zombie turns its head. It's looking right at me. I jump at it, bringing my knife down to impale its rotted brain. But the fucker is quick and sidesteps. Frank cocks back the shotgun. No! I say. I know all too well these fuckers like to travel in crowds. And the appearance of this smelly son of a bitch means bad news for us if we decide to make noise. I kick out at the zombie as it claws towards me. Then I jab the knife under the zombie's ribs, ripping open the black flesh. The stinking entrails pour out, making me gag. But I've got no time to complain about the smell. I rip the knife out of the fucker's stomach, bring it up and around, as it lets out a vicious snarl. I stick the bastard in the side of its skull, cutting the building scream off before it can call out to the others. I fall away, shielding my nose. Frank approaches the carcass, kicks it a bit. Guess it's double dead. I let out a bark of laughter. I can't help it. We decide to get back onto the highway and travel until dawn. Steve is falling asleep as he walks. I decide to carry him on my back. Around noon, we hear the engines. We flee off the highway, and after a few minutes, they appear. Three jeeps in a van, tearing down the highway. The skulls painted on their sides claim them as raiders, Frank tells us. We wait for a few minutes until the engines die away into the distance. It's getting dangerous. Frank chews his lip. We can't go on the back roads, I tell him. We need a car, Renee says. I shake my head. A car will make noise. These raiders seem to be searching for something. Most likely us. Then we need to stick to the highway, says Frank. We just need to be cautious. The following day, the horde finds us. I guess the raiders tearing down the highway had drawn their attention. There are more than 50 zombies scattered on the highway. About three clicks away, Frank says looking through his binoculars. Damn it, I say, rubbing my forehead. We could try to skirt around them, Renee says. I chew my lip, thinking, No, I've got a better idea. I approach a car. I reach in and honk the horn, loud. What the hell do you think you're doing? Snarls Frank, his face turning pale. He looks through the binoculars once more and shakes his head. Oh, shit. Oh, motherfucking shit. They turning? I ask. Frank nods his head. Quick, get behind the car. I dive behind the car ten feet in front of us, facing sidelong toward the edge of the highway. Minutes tick by. Steve's eyes grow wide as they come within earshot. They're moans of hunger like fingernails across your spine. I hold my finger up to my lips, telling Steve to keep quiet. He nods. They come closer, footsteps crunching on grass, breath racking from open maws, their shadows visible as they pass. Frank has bones held tightly, but the dog is well trained and doesn't make a sound. A few minutes pass and the footsteps fall away. I check that the coast is clear, both directions. 
And it is. Frank shakes his head at me. Next time you do something like that, I might just damn well shoot you. Two days pass by with good progress. The winter is getting closer, but I think we'll make it before it's truly upon the land. We're running low on food, so when we come to the next town, we leave Renee and Steve and head into town. We avoid the few zombies on the road. We check the houses, check the stores. We end up with a few tins of carrots and a bag of rice. It's when I'm walking back to the front of the store that a zombie comes limping through the aisle. We both freeze for a moment, and then it throws back its head and rushes at me. I go for the pistol in my belt, but the goddamn zombie caught me off guard. It's on me before I know it. Its breath is death on acid. I hold off its bites with one arm and blindly reach for my pistol with the other until I find it. I stick the barrel of the gun to its head and blast its brains across the floor. Frank comes running in from the back, bones beside him. Holy fuck, are you alright? He asks, and I look down at my arm. There's a bite mark. Frank takes a step back, shaking his head. No. I shake my head, wiping the blood onto the zombie's jacket. Don't tell them. You... you know what that means. It means I'm a walking dead man. We could cut off your arm. Frank nods. He takes his knife from his belt. The fuck you're cutting my arm off with that toothpick? I smile. (sighs) Guess you can't always be lucky. Frank smiles sadly. Guess so. Frank gives me his coat to hide the bite mark. We rejoin Renee and Steve, and once more set out along the highway. Frank is wary of me now. I can see him watching me, never far away from the shotgun. I can't blame him. Neither of us know how long I have, and I made him promise to me that he would put an end to me before I could hurt Renee or Steve. Bones also seems wary of me. She doesn't approach me anymore and growls when I come too close. Three days after I'd been bitten, we hear the engines once more, and we shuffle off the highway just in time. The jeeps come hurtling around the bend. More approach from the far end of the highway. They screech to a halt right in front of us, and I curse my luck. They'd seen us. Frank looks at me, his eyes filled with questions. Then he nods to me, steps out onto the highway, cocks the shotgun and runs at the jeep. I can see the men inside of the jeep's cab from here. The pale-faced man notices Frank, and that's when the shotgun shell rips open his face. Smashing through the glass, Frank doesn't give them time to react. He cocks the shotgun once more. Bones is beside him, growling at the jeep and the other man inside the cab ducks out the far side. The man lets off a shot from his pistol. The shot goes wide. Frank aims, making the man duck back down behind the jeep as the shot tears into the back, ripping open metal. The jeeps are approaching now from the other side of the highway. Frank says something and Bones leaps into action, rushing around the side of the jeep and out of view. All I can hear are the screams. Jeeps come tearing up the highway and screech to a stop. Men jump off the back, armed with automatic rifles. Frank aims his shotgun, but a blind man could see he was outgunned. Drop your weapon! One of the men shout. You first! Frank says, cool as a summer's breeze. Bones has finished her job. The screams have fallen silent. 
She approaches Frank, her growls audible from here. One of the men take aim, let off a shot, and it rips Bones' skull open in the shower of blood. You bastards! Screams Frank, and he rushes at him. Another rifle shot peels through the air and catches Frank in the chest. He collapses. Renee is holding her hand over Steve's mouth, who is crying. The men approach Frank. Who else is with you? One of the men asks. I'm alone. Frank holds up his hands, and I have to give him credit for sounding so sincere. The final bullet rips through Frank's skull, and his arms fall to the ground. Blood pools where a friend had just been. It's a highway that leads nowhere. A backpack containing not enough food for three people. Dire straits, as my father used to say. Winter has come, and with it we must find shelter. You sure we'll find a boat? Asks Renee. My wife is losing weight, and the shadows around her eyes grow deeper with every new moon. I nod. We'll find one. I rub Steve's head, and he gives me a smile. Days pass, and we inch our way across the land. Landmarks pass us by. Empty way markers in a nightmarish hinterland. Steve has never seen the sea. When we approach the sandy ridge, the land opens out to the roaring waves. He runs down the slope, and I don't call him back. I've got five bullets left in the magazine. The same amount since the last time I'd checked. The days spent traversing the highway have been plagued with zombies and our resources of both food and ammo are dwindling. Stopping by the water, Steve takes off his boots and lets the water run over his pale feet, which look blistered. I pick up a stone and skip it across the water, watching the circle spread out and disappear. Two days later, we find the boat. We climb aboard, but the engine is dry. I must find fuel. Steve wants to come with me, but I say no. I head into town and come upon a pump station. Inside are dusty jerry cans. I fill one up and then another and hike back to the coast. And that's when I see them. I count ten idling along the beach. Soon they will come upon the boat. Damn it. I drop the jerry cans in the boat. Fill it, I tell Renee. They are close now. Close enough to see the whites of their eyes. Close enough to hear their gasping moans. I check my pistol, making sure it's not on safety, which it isn't. The closest one picks up my scent and I aim. It lets out a shriek before breaking into a loping run. My bullet tears through its skull, ripping open the fetid brain inside. The others are running now too. I let off two more shots, taking another one down, and run to the boat and climb inside. Renee has the engine filled. I tell her to help me move the boat, but she's too focused on them coming closer, and I have to shake her. Then we move it back into the waves. They're upon us. I go to shield Renee. My last two bullets rip through the nearest one's head. Renee is pulling on the starter. The boat comes to life with a belching roar, and I run to climb in. But I feel something jump onto my back and teeth gnaw down into my neck. And he falls beneath the waves. I watch 
As my father emerges, eyes wide, skittering about, and he's gone. We turn away, tears in our eyes, and sail towards the distant horizon. That was Dire Straits by author Rory Duane. A good reminder to never take your modern conveniences for granted. Like asparagus, for example. Yeah, a little about the author. Oh, Rory, also known as R.C.J. Duane, is an author living in the Midlands of Ireland. Now, he's currently writing a young adult novel based on a dream he had, titled The Del Vere, College of Dreams and Magic. You can check out his website at RoryDwayneArt.wordpress.com. Uh, thanks, Rory. And do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. He needs soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and he appreciates it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment, 10 bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend, and stop looking at me like that. They can't all be hour and a half long episodes, all right? Here, take two drinks, okay? You happy now? I'd like to say hello and welcome to all my newest patrons. We're having a good time over there, y'all. Better come by and check it out. And a very special welcome and hello to one of our newest patrons, Mama Sturdivant. Hey, Mrs. Sturdivant. Thank you for joining up. It's a pleasure having you. Jeff needs to be looked after sometimes. He's a mess, ain't he? And I bet between you and me, we can probably keep him in line most of the time. Well, we'll give it a shot anyway, won't we? But it is nice having you. And if anybody else wants to see what the fuss is all about when me and Jeff and a one Paul J. McSorley get together, stop on by patreon.com forward slash Drew Blood and help feed the alligator. So may the wind be at your back and may the road rise up to meet you. Here's to eyes in your heads and none in your spuds. And as usual, go fuck yourselves. Good night, y'all.